Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Welcome to the Bread of the Word podcast, a podcast striving to feast on God's Word and let the Bible speak to us all. Let us, as a former generation said, go ad fontes to the fountain and be nourished and sustained by all that God is. Let's dig in together. Well, hello, and welcome back to the Bread of the Word podcast, where we go ad fontes to the fountain, to the Word of God, to be nourished and sustained by all that God is, as he's revealed himself to us. My name is Tyler, and I'm your host, and we are continuing to grapple with the book of Job, verse by verse, section by section. In this case, it'll be an entire chapter. We are getting to, we're getting out of the narrative portion of the opening chapters of Job. And so from Job 3 on to around chapter 38 is going to be predominantly poetry. And so we may have to take bigger chunks in spots like we have here, but it's, that's just, that's just the way it's divided. There's there's, that's one of the challenges with Job is that you have these big chunks sometimes. And so we're going to start with the end of chapter two, with the last bit of um, with the last bit of narrative, because I think that helps us to establish the the background behind what Job is about to say in poetry. So verse chapter two, verse eleven says, "Now when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite," heard about all this adversity that happened to him. Again, that word adversity. Um, other translations might put that is evil, like some of these older translations. I think the King James puts it as evil. And again, we have that, that hard spot where God is communicated as if he does evil. Not in the sense that God is evil, or our Western idea of evil, but the fact that bad things have happened. That this is a harsh reality that Job is living in, and he uses very extreme language here to convey that. So the adversity that had happened to him, each of them came from his home. They met together to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they looked from a distance, they could barely recognize him. Why? Because of the the amount of stress he was under, the amount of suffering he had endured, they could not recognize him. And they wept aloud, and each man tore his robe and threw dust in the air and on his head. So they are grieving with him. We saw he did similar things in chapter 1. And so Job's friends are grieving with him. They are weeping with those who weep. Then they sat on the ground with him seven days and nights, but no one spoke a word to him because they saw that his suffering was very intense. There's a lot of truth in that. That from a To look at this from a counseling perspective... I'm not a certified biblical counselor, but I have read a bit on the subject, and there's a lot to be gained from just sitting with people sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm somebody that, when it comes to theology and the Bible, I like to talk. Uh, this, is, this, this is my jam. This is what I like to do. But there's, there's a time to be still. There's a time to be quiet. There's a time to just be there for people to listen even when nothing's being said. And so we have three new characters introduced like in this 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 play this this um play that we're seeing play out we're seeing characters introduced um and these have names and we'll see them again they will um be, play a very prominent role in the next long section of Job as we transition through chapters 4 through 30 something. You'll see a lot with these guys, and you're not going to like some of them. But uh, 
uh, we have names, we have characters, and again, prior to prior to here, every character that Job has had in his company has been anonymous. Not even his wife is given a name, but these three we have names, and so they they come and they gather with him and they they mourn with him. Essentially, they they weep, they they tear their robes, they throw dust in the air. And for seven days and seven nights, they sit in silence with him. Beginning chapter 3. After this, Job began to speak. And given what we've seen in, in the last two chapters, our expectations is the next verse, he's going to say something like, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. After this, Job began to speak and cursed the day he was born. Yikes. <clears throat> Verse 2, he said, May the day I was born perish, and the night that said a boy is conceived. If only that day had turned to darkness. May God above not care about it, or light shine on it. May darkness and gloom reclaim it, and a cloud settle over it. May what darkens the day terrify it. If only darkness had taken that night away, may it not appear among the days of the year, or be listed in the calendar. Yes, may that, day, that night be barren. May no joyful shout be heard in it. Let those who curse days condemn it. Those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. May its morning stars grow dark. May it wait for daylight, but have none. May it not see the breaking of dawn. For that night did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and hide sorrow from my eyes. Fun stuff. So, <clears throat> he curses the day he was born. This is a dramatic transition from what we saw just a couple weeks ago blessed be the name of the lord we have job in the pit and one of the glorious things about job about the book of job is that god does not chastise job for saying what he says job is going to say some things in this book that we likely when things are going well would not think we would ever say to god it's easy for us to say that because we've likely not been where Job is. And so it's easy to sit on the outside and say, I would never say that to God. I wouldn't dare say that to God. And despite that, Job is not punished for saying the things he says. That God, for the majority of the book, takes it almost in silence. And I think there's there's truth to that of God's of God's patience, of his of his faithfulness. That while Job is saying some of the things he says, God is still God. And he didn't go anywhere, despite all this. But back to the text. So Job curses the day he was born. May the day I was born perish, and the night that said a boy is conceived. How did we get here? Why, why curse the day you were born? What is the advantage here? Verse 10, wife, for that night did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and hide sorrow from my eyes. May the day I was bo born be cursed because it did not prevent me from experiencing sorrow. That poses a very real question for us as, not just as believers, but as people when there is sorrow, when there is pain, is it worth it? When we experience pain, when we experience loss, when we experience suffering and sorrow, is it worth it? <clears throat> and many times we may ask questions like Job. Why was I not stillborn? Verse 11. Why didn't I die as I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? And why were there breaths for me to nurse? Now I would certainly be lying down in peace. I would be asleep. Then I would be at rest with the kings and counselors of the earth. See, it says in Ecclesiastes that the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Why? Because of the frivolity of life under the sun. 
The challenge of Ecclesiastes is much like the challenge of Job, is where is meaning when life is hard? Where is meaning when there is suffering in the world, when there is injustice or perceived injustice? When the just and the unjust all die? Where is the meaning? Why was I not a stillborn? Why did the need receive me? There are five questions asked in this chapter. Why, 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 why? And maybe that is where you are today, is asking the question, why? Why this? Why that? Why God? And in this text, in this portion, we're not really given an answer. And that is honestly what the book of Job is fleshing out is answers and meaning. From here on, we will have this, this dialogue between Job and his three friends. And then another guy will come a little bit later, and they'll start hashing this out, trying to figure out why is Job experiencing this? Why is Job enduring this? Because they don't know about the conversation between God and Satan in chapter 1. None of them do. That's not information that they have. And so they are grappling with um, Job's predicament, and they are grappling with God in the midst of it. They are, as Jacob did, they are wrestling with God. Why was he not stillborn? Why didn't he die as he came from the womb? Ecclesiastes 10.5 says, Just as you do not know how bones form in the womb of a pregnant woman, so do you do not understand the ways of God who made everything. And that's... Honestly, there are very similar themes in Ecclesiastes that there are in Job. And I, I personally believe that Job was written first, and that Ecclesiastes, while written by Solomon... I think Solomon gets a lot of his language and a lot of his ideas from Job. I think Job influenced the the writing style of Solomon. And if you've been following Bread of the Word for a while, we spent about ten months going through the book of Ecclesiastes. We spent almost a year in the uh, book of Ecclesiastes, and it's a hard book. It's a depressing book sometimes, Job likewise, because we've got this big long chapter cursing the day he was born. What do we do with that? And I would encourage us to take the stance that many in the early church did and look for Christ in this hard passage. Because Job cursed the day he was born. But Galatians 3 tells us that Christ became a curse, that we would be set free from the law. Christ suffered willingly, why that we would be reconciled to him, that he would be Lord of heaven and earth to assert his lordship over us. Job suffered because he was struck down by God. He was afflicted by God, by Satan, by external forces, but ultimately it was the decree of God that put him where he is. Isaiah 53 tells us that, that Christ, the suffering servant, was smitten of God and afflicted. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him. As a matter of fact, let's turn there right now. Isaiah 53. Which is a text we've gone to on more than one occasion with the Bread of the Word podcast. But Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. Unlike Job, he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave from the wicked but he was with a rich man at his death because he had not he had done no violence and had not spoken 
deceitfully. Verse 10, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities, not his own. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the many, the mighty as a spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Rejoice, child, as one who did not give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who have not been in labor, but the children of the desolate will be more than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the side of your tent, and let your tent curtains be stretched back. Do not hold back. Lengthen your ropes, and drive your pegs deep, for you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will dispossess nations, inhabit the desolate cities. Job suffered. And in some real sense, Job's sufferings could be taken as a prophecy. Looking ahead to when Christ suffers for us. When Christ bears our sins in his body. That we might die to sin and live unto righteousness. <clears throat> so Christ became a curse. When Job cursed the day he was born, Christ became a curse. And he died. And it's like, like I said, it says in Ecclesiastes that the, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. For you do not know what comes after. So Christ died. And three days later, he rose from the dead, triumphant, demonstrating that he is God. So he couldn't stay dead. So he rose triumphantly from the dead, asserting that he is Lord of heaven and earth. That he was who he said he was. He was the Son of God in flesh. And he ascended into heaven. And just as Job is in need of a mediator, as we will see in later sections of Job, as we've even seen somewhat here, that there's not a middleman between God and Job. Job doesn't know what's going on. But he's kind of isolated here. But Christ ascended into heaven and makes intercession for us, that he stands in the gap for us. It says in Hebrews that he ever liveth to make intercession for his people. <clears throat> And so Job's sufferings, Job's anguish, points us ahead to the Christ that suffered infinitesimally more than Job, if you could imagine. But Job wants to die, because then I would be at rest with the kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruined cities for themselves, or with princes who had gold or filled their houses with silver. Why was I not hidden like a miscarried child, like infants who never see daylight? There the wicked cease to make trouble, and there the weary find rest. In death. The captives are completely at rest. They do not hear a taskmaster's voice. Both small and great are there, and the slave is set free from his master. Charles Spurgeon once put it that six feet of earth make all men equal that one of the things about death is it is the great equalizer. That the just, the unjust, the rich and the poor, the wise and the stupid, all die. They all meet death. When we were working through Ecclesiastes, I became fond of the phrase, memento mori, memento vitae. Which is Latin, but it means, remember you must die, remember you must live. Because at the end of the day, our life and our death is before the face of God. So we, we must die in Christ. And we must live 
in Christ. Why? Because Christ died and he also lived. And so if we be in Christ, that is where we go. We go from death to life with him. But Job's not done asking questions. Verse 20, Why is light given to one burdened with grief and life to those whose ex existence is bitter, who wait for death, but it does not come, and search for it more than for hidden treasure, who are filled with much joy and are glad when they reach the grave? That's a picture of nihilism if I've ever seen one. There are, there are people like that today waiting for death waiting to die and in some real sense they've already arrived why is life given to a man whose path is hidden whom God has hedged in we keep seeing this phrase hedge and you know in the the Baptist church many of us are familiar with the phrase hedge of protection and I've always thought that was kind of funny because I'm picturing a big green thing um because we pray for a hedge of protection. And it's kind of this goofy little, little saying. But uh, the idea comes from Job. Because we see this here. We see this in... We actually see this in the dialogue with God and Satan, if you remember. Does Job fear God for not? Has Job feared God for nothing? Haven't you put a hedge around everything he owns? So why is life hidden to a man whose path is... Given to a man whose path is hidden? whom God has hedged in. Why is life given to a man who does not know the outcome? Again, this is very Solomonic. This is very reminiscent of Ecclesiastes. My favorite verse in the Old Testament is Ecclesiastes 7.13. Consider the work of God, for who can straighten what he has made crooked? And the harsh part of that is sometimes God makes things crooked. The, the Hebrew there literally means what he has bent. That is, A, a picture of his sovereignty, of, of his total control over things. But it also shows the harsh reality that hard things are still what he intended them to be. Why is life given to a man whose path is bent? That, that's a hard question. And God doesn't always answer that question for us with an intellectual scenario. He doesn't address the trolley problem to, to get all philosophical with you by picking one rail or the other. He doesn't give us an answer. He gives us himself. <clears throat> Verse 24, I sigh when food is put before me. And my groans pour out like water. For the thing I feared has overtaken me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I cannot relax or be calm. I have no rest, for turmoil has come. I believe this also alludes to Christ on the cross. They did not feed him. He drank sour wine. He, when they pierced him, blood and water flowed. And he was the son of God. God incarnate. God in flesh was overtaken by death. And there's a, there's a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when he pleads with God take this cup from me if it be thy will take this cup from me where Jesus in his humanity because he's truly God truly man he didn't cease to be God but he added a nature to that and it's, it's a beautiful mystery that he was God and human at the same time and in his humanity he dreaded dying and yet he still went. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. So on the cross, you could say, 
he could not relax or be calm. He had no rest for turmoil. For tur turmoil has come. Because Christ became a curse. He bore our sins in his body. That we might die to sin and live under righteousness. And much like Job, he suffered immensely. That everything Job has said here could also have been said by Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think that's by design. I think that is is the point. Is that just as we may suffer as Job did, Christ suffered as well. And what that means is we have a priest who has been where we are. We have a priest who knows the feeling. It's one of the beautiful things of God coming down the mountain and dwelling with us as a human being, experiencing human life firsthand. That he was born, he grew up, he lived, he died. <clears> that <throat> he is able to sympathize with the people he intercedes for. So when his mercies are new every morning, they're not generic mercies, but Christ meets needs because he knows the needs. And so as we conclude chapter 3, I would implore you to seek the face of Christ, to go to the Christ who knows the these things intimately. Go to God who became a curse for you. Who was born, lived, and died, and rose again to reconcile it to, you, to himself. That he became the chastisement for our peace. That he forced, he abandoned his own peace in a very real sense, on the cross. To which he, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he did all that for us. He suffered so that we can live. He died so we can live. And because he was raised, we also will be restored. Consider my servant Christ, a man of perfect integrity, who feareth God and escheweth evil. No one on earth is like him. Thank you for listening. This has been the Bread of the Word podcast. Bread of the Word is a podcast ministry striving to feed people the wonderful words of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse striving to let the word speak for itself. This ministry is also a member of the Truth and Love Network, a diverse fellowship of fellow podcasts of different theological backgrounds united in the gospel of God. For more from the Bread of the Word podcast or the Truth and Love Network, check out the links below and follow us on social media. Until next time, God bless. Matthew 4.4 4.